Hello Star Wars fans, Jeremiah here from the Star Trader and today is a very special episode. We're going to be talking about none other than Grand Admiral Thrawn, my favorite character if you guys haven't guessed it from my previous videos. Uh, today we're actually going to be talking about the book which just fell on the floor so I'm going to pick it up. My precious, I'm so sorry. So I just finished this book a day or so ago and ah, uh, Timothy Zahn has blown me away once again. I had just actually finished the Thrawn Trilogy the day before my my new book, the new book got delivered to me. So it was really cool to see the parallels that uh, Timothy Zahn had made in his original trilogy in the 90s and what he had decided to include in his new story or his new version of Thrawn uh, this year. So we're going to talk about some of those parallels as well as, uh, so this, I guess, the actual story of Thrawn. We're also going to be talking about some of the hints that he talks about regarding the future of Star Wars and how Thrawn plays a part in that, as well as the possible past and how Thrawn has played a part in the past of Star Wars. Um, two very interesting dynamics indeed, so let's jump right into Hyperdrive. So the first thing that we get into when reading the story is uh, there's an Imperial ship that lands on a uh, deserted planet seemingly only to be taken by surprise having their troops uh, getting wheeled down and their ships destroyed and captured. Well, it ends up being Thrawn himself, but he can't really speak basic or galactic basic English in our universe for those um, who don't know how they call English, because obviously England doesn't exist in Star Wars. Galactic Basic, he's not very fluent in it, in fact he has a very hard time communicating with the Imperials aboard, were it not for a certain cadet named Eli Vanto, who just so happens to live in the wild space regions which neighbors the unknown regions. And if anybody is familiar with uh, Thrawn's race, the Chiss, um, he, his world actually it resides in the unknown regions. Um, part of that's part of the galaxy that hasn't been largely explored because it's very dangerous and nobody knows what's there. Not a lot of people voyage out there because of how of the many bad stories that they hear. Not only about the Chiss, but of that area in general. We also get his first introduction into the Star Wars lore and I get, we also know his real name. It took me forever to try to pronounce it but I think I got it down. Let's see. Um, Mithra Nuduodo. Mithra... Let's, let's try it again. Mithra Nuduodo. <laughs> well, I think it's really cool. Um, apparently the Chiss uh, language and I apologize if there has been a language set up prior to this but I was never exposed to it but it's really cool because there's a lot of uh, uh, there's apostrophes and I'll I'll show you how to spell it like right here. Mithranu Mithranu right there. <laughs> That's his real name, but because he knows it's hard to communicate that all the time, as I just try to say it, he just says, "But it may be easier to call me Thrawn." Mithranuduo. That's where it comes from. So that's really cool. Little be, little piece of uh, backstory for Thrawn there, and what his actual heritage is. Uh, apparently, he was exiled from his planet because he had a uh, butting of heads with the Chiss ascendancy and the leaders there as to how to eliminate a potential foe. They had a falling out, if you will, and they exiled him. Um, so that's how he, uh, using his wits, he uh, managed to stow away on the Imperial shuttle, impress the, the, the captain of said shuttle, and he hitched a ride back to Coruscant where he met Emperor Palpatine. Uh, he proposed to Palpatine that he would uh, lend his, his expertise in navigation and mapping of the unknown regions in exchange for protection and uh, against uh, whatever foe that the Chiss may be having to deal with. Um, so that's an interesting development. Uh, the, 
Emperor doesn't seem too interested up until Ron tells him that he wants that he can map the unknown regions for him. Now, why he knows that the Emperor is interested in the unknown regions is not entirely uh, given away, which hints to a possible past where Timothy Zan, who's already hinted at making more books, by the way, will probably tell us how he knows this information. Now, if you've read my other videos, uh, I go into a little bit of detail as far as uh, Supreme Leader Snoke's origins, which I'll leave a video right here, so you can check it out and see what my theories are on that and why Emperor Palpatine wants to go into the Unknown Regions. Um, so that's why he's interested in Thrawn's proposal, because he needs somebody who knows the area to navigate it. Um, that also ties in with Empire's End, actually where in the epilogue of that story, there's a brief mention of Thrawn too. So I think that's really cool that all the authors are coming from getting one source and kind of using that common knowledge to come together to explain what's going to be happening uh, before The Force Awakens. It's really cool that they're all tying all, all this together here. Admiral Thrawn, or not even an admiral yet, uh, he's a cadet alongside his onsign um, Eli Vanto, who is assigned to be his translator for some time until he is able to communicate better with BASIC. He can talk BASIC pretty well, but it's the nuances of the language that really give him trouble. Um, so he uses Eli as uh, a translator or I guess a communicator in a way and a sort of... Uh, it, it's hard to say, he kind of has him as a disciple in a way because as the story goes on Eli Vanto starts to learn more about how Thrawn thinks, and the way that this, that this book is written, um, in between the actions of an individual when we're seeing it through Thrawn's perspective, um, you'll see how Thrawn notices a person's body motions, how they say something, the muscles clenching, and the eye dilation, or the manner of speaking. He notices all that and is able to deduce um, what their intentions are or how they're feeling and act accordingly. He's a very smart guy. The story also um, brings back the fact, and this is of course evidence not only in the original trilogy but um, in Star Wars Rebels where Thrawn uses art as a weapon and there's a specific uh, page in it that's just so beautifully written on why he uses art to his advantage and why that's so important to him um, in learning how to deduce an enemy's or of an entire species moves and we see that in action in a couple of places more than a couple of places actually um, and it's very reminiscent to what Timothy Zahn does in um, Heirs of the Empire, Dark Force Rising, very methodical the way of thinking in incorporating a species art to deduce how they think. It, it, it's unlike anything uh, any villain has ever done in the Star Wars universe. Not even Grand Moff Tarkin is, I think, that smart, to be honest. So, um, another, another thing, this story is just um, about uh, Governor Price, actually. If you remember Governor Price from Star Wars Rebels, she's the governor of Lothal, which the Rebels are trying to take back. It's just as much about her as it is Thrawn and vice versa. We see both of these people actually uh, learn and rise to the ranks. Thrawn through military and Price through politics. They both have their strengths and their paths connect at different points of the story and they end up needing each other more than they than they think they do except Price. She knows exactly what she's doing when she tries to you know proposition Thrawn for something. She's really politically smart that way. Um, at the end of the book she ends up of course being the governor of Lothal and is, is the owner of a vast uh, array of mining operations, uh, refining uh, industries, 
on the planet itself and I believe they're moons if I'm not mistaken. So she's got her own great thing going on. And by the end of the book we of course get at Thrawn be promoted to Grand Admiral. It is a position that hasn't been given to anybody in the Imperial Navy so far and it is his classic white tunic, gold bar shoulder pads, and of course the insignia that he has on his left upper corner chest thing. So you can think of the position of a Grand Admiral basically um, in a military standpoint as high as a Grand Moff in a way except the Grand Moff can sort of go into military positions but that's a story for a different video anyway um, it's really cool because Thrawn isn't just automatically made a Grand Admiral we get to see his rise in power and influence in this book um, so to have an origin story for this this wonderful beautiful blue skin villain is something that I've been waiting for for forever he starts out I think yeah as a cadet alongside uh, Eli Vanto or who's his on sign rather so he starts out as a cadet he becomes uh, a lieutenant yes he becomes a lieutenant and then he becomes a commodore and then an admiral and then grand admiral and each stage he's met with opposition not only from wartime enemies but from his own uh, circle of Imperials and I'll explain that if you watch any of the Star Wars movies all almost all if not all of the Imperials are human Grand Admiral Thrawn is a chiss so you can just imagine uh, the race issue that he had to go through and man did he have to put up with it so much but the way that he puts up with it is just so graceful he doesn't give these guys the time of day to point out that he's just a blue skin alien he rises above it and doesn't let that hinder what he wants to do what his ultimate goal is and that is something I admire deeply in this villain and albeit he is a villain but this book humanizes him more more so than Timothy Zahn did in the original trilogy with his appreciation for art and of course his mortality in dying in the way he died at the end um, so he didn't die in this book no 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 this is set before Rebels so don't don't worry about it he, he's good <laughs> what I'm trying to say is though is I can I can sort of relate to that in a way because I'm being in a minority. Um, I, I'm Mexican. Arriba, yeah. <laughs> uh, I can relate to the, that a little bit because honestly, um, unless you're a minority, um, you, you can't really understand what it's like to grow up um, and kind of overcome these invi invisible obstacles that are before you simply because of who you are and. That's just the world we live in, and Star Wars kind of brought that into us with different alien races. We have this all-human empire that is um, restricting and putting roadblocks in front of this um, newcomer, this alien. Um, <laughs> get it, alien, illegal, alien. I, I, I'm legal, guys, don't worry. I met again in here. But yeah, that, that, that was completely relatable, and I, it made me love Thrawn even more for that. And it makes me want to live my life gracefully too, keeping my head held high above my enemies and tell them, "You sit down." You know, it, it's really, it was really well written, and, and I thank you, Timothy Zahn, for putting those parallels, intentional or not, into the book. Yeah, it was a really nice touch. Throughout the book, um, Thrawn fights this enemy, or I guess has a, a, a rivalry, if you will with a enigma called uh, Night Swan. A Night Swan is responsible for sabotaging Thrawn at every corner, almost getting him court-martialed a couple times. Thrawn isn't really able to figure out who this person is throughout the whole series until, uh, you know, very close to the end he's like, oh wait, it might be this, and he takes a hunch, and it ends up being the person. Um, you, you actually get to meet the person in the beginning of, I, I guess, the first few chapters. 
person's name is Signy. Um, after a while, Signy escapes. You never hear from him again. And then Night Swan pops up out of nowhere and is trying to sabotage Thrawn, um, seemingly for no reason until we figure out, oh, it's because Thrawn was, you know, messing with him before, and there was an pre there's like a mutual appreciation between Thrawn and Night Swan. They're actually very similar and very unlike. Now, tying this back to when we call Thrawn a villain. Yes, he is part of the Empire, which is responsible for the deaths of millions and millions and millions of people. However, he is not so stupid as to think that killing in itself is the, the, or the means that justify the end. Throughout the book, we see him finding different methods of defeating the enemy, that it does not include killing people. He's very honorable. And he tries to avoid killing people at all costs. This gets him in trouble a lot. So it's really interesting to see that dynamic and his his way of going around it. It's very smart. It's really hard not to kill somebody because killing somebody is easy. And not killing somebody in these sorts of situations is very hard. Especially when you're, par when you're an admiral. When you're a figurehead in the military and you're trying to cause as the least casualties as possible that's a lot of weight on your shoulders and that takes a lot of thinking and strategy it just speaks to how smart this guy is anyway Thrawn and Night Swan or Ratley we know him as Signy now are talking they Thrawn says I just want to talk oddly enough Thrawn offers Signy or Night Swan a position in the Chiss Ascendancy because he thinks his expertise in strategy can benefit his own people against bigger threats, like the Empire. Signy, of course, declines and says he needs to be there for his people. And another reason why he kind of is like, what are you talking about? Uh, a human among the Chiss? And Thrawn's like, surely it's no different for a Chiss among the humans. You, you know, it, it, it's a very interesting parallel. And I think if Signy went along with that, um, he would have ended up in a similar position to Thrawn right now. So two very, very similar people with two very different outcomes. Um, whereas Signy or, or Night Swan sees the value in fighting for a better galaxy, um, Thrawn thinks by doing that it is wasting lives and that by leading the galaxy in a better direction he can wait out the Emperor's death and influence somebody much better than, than the Emperor to take his place and therefore making uh, the all-powerful tyrannical um, Empire into a more benign entity. That is his way of thinking. And, it, and it's very interesting because we kind of see that going on in, in the original Thrawn trilogy, and you can kind of see that in the in way uh, Captain Pelayan thinks, and how he sees that the old empire dies and the new empire is arising, where the old empire was very brutal in its attacks and there was no mercy to be had. Thrawn's empire was more dignified and strategically merciful, but I. You know, I gotta be honest, I haven't read the duology of Thrawn, and that <laughs> that may tell me a little bit more as to Thrawn's uh, reason to still fighting for the Empire, um, but generally speaking, there's more humanity in Thrawn brought into the new book than there was in the original trilogy, and we have him... There was never really a reason for Thrawn to be in the Empire in the original trilogy. Now, it's a little bit more fleshed out in the new book that we got, um, and, it, and how it kind of ties into everything, which is really cool. Um, he's not really evil, he just plays a really long game, and mathematically to him, when it comes to lives, it makes sense to serve an Empire through the long run, and see it out to become something better than to thwart it now and create chaos. He doesn't like chaos, that's the thing. 
Thrawn is a very organized person, both in his mind and in his appearance. Um, to allow the rebels to continue the chaos to him is, uh, in itself, chaos is evil. Therefore, he cannot allow the rebels to continue doing what they're doing. So, that's where Rebels comes in. That's why he's fighting with the Empire. He has an arsenal to take out and remove this chaos and let the Empire run its course. I, I think that's an, that's an amazing twist to everything here. And it, it, like I said before, it, it gives him humanity a little bit more. Even for someone who's not a human. Which speaks a lot to the actual humans in this galaxy, don't you think? Another thing that I wanted to talk about was the fact that we learned early on that Thrawn knows Anakin Skywalker. We don't know how, apparently there was a mission in the unknown regions where Anakin was needed, and they know each other now, which made for an interesting dynamic where in the very last couple pages of the book, um, or the last few pages, he meets Darth Vader, and it makes you wonder. Does Thrawn know who Darth Vader is? It's not, it's not entirely clear, but one can only wonder. But we also, like I said, we still don't know how they know each other. Apparently they, they met in the Chiss Ascendancy. Um, so that's probably a story for another time that Timothy Zahn has planned. And by the way, Thrawn was never exiled in the first place. The Chiss Ascendancy made it look like an exile. That way he would get access to the Empire using the credentials of him meeting Anakin in the first place, Empire knowing Anakin, a Jedi, getting attend that got him a meeting with Empire, or the Emperor, and got him access to knowing the potential enemy better. So all this time, all this time, Thrawn and his people devised a really long game plan, years in the making to learn about who the Empire is, what they're doing, if they're good or not, now now they're gonna know. And what's cool is um, Eli Vanto, um, Thrawn's on-sign and later on com Lieutenant Commander in the film, or <laughs> in the book, sorry, is actually taken back, well not taken really, he goes on his own will so he, I, it doesn't really say but I think he leaves the Empire to join the Chiss Ascendancy because he knows uh, the, their language that they speak. Um, it, it, the exact name of the language escapes my mind at the moment, but because he knows their language, um, the position that Thrawn had offered Night Swan probably went to Eli Vanto. And what's cool about that is that where where Thrawn is enthralled with art um, and using that as a strategy, Eli Vanto is really good with numbers. He viewed numbers pretty much the same way that Thrawn did. Um, he was able to deduce so many things from the numbers that were presented to him in a situation. And I think that's why they, they admired, admired each other so much and why uh, Thrawn kept Eli around, and how, why uh, Eli Vanto decided that, yeah, maybe it's best to hang out with Thrawn, because at first, he, he didn't like to hang out with Thrawn at all. It was uh, it was a no-no. Um, there were myths about the Chiss that it's like, well, the Chiss are in trouble, you can't hang out with them. Even his parents were dismissive of him hanging out with Thrawn, so um, it, 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 it was really cool to see how that all turned around. I haven't talked about Governor Price. Man, her story was really cool. Um, she actually started out to um, being the manager of a uh, mining operation on the planet Lethal until the government bought out her mine when they struck Dunium. Um, now, the whole theme about Dunium is that it had been uh, any time that Dunium was found on any planet, the Empire would sweep on in and collect it and run the mines dry. It is later deduced that the reason why the Empire needed so much dunium, which is one of the rarest metals in the galaxy, was to build a Death Star, among other metals like durasteel and iridium, etc. And of course, uh, Tabana gas, uh, which you'll remember from Empire Strikes Back, Tabana gas was the main 
export from Cloud City, that's what they were mining, because the whole dang planet was basically Tabata gas. And uh, Tabata gas is, ba is used for uh, mainly hyperdrive coolants, uh, as well as accelerant for starships, etc., which that is actually going to be another video in the future. I'm going to explain the mechanics of Tabana gas hyperdrives. It's going to be fun! Anyway, back to Governor Price. Uh, she, uh, yeah, like I said, she started out as uh, uh, just a manager, supervisor. She owned about 60% of the company with her family. Uh, the, the governor owned like 30% and the senator earned like 10%. Well, there was a whole coup of all that, and her and her family were forced to sell out the mine because of the Empire was going to come in and sweep it in anyway. Uh, ultimately, she had to move to Coruscant. She had to start... She was up here. She was brought down a few rungs in society. She had to work her way back up. She knew politics already, so it wasn't so hard for her to go up there, but at the same time, she was willing to do a lot of questionable things to get her way there. Lots of betrayals for her friends. Um, she had to sideswipe the senator that got her into this situation in the first place, Senator Ranking, if I remember correctly. Um, and then from there, uh, she used her influence in Coruscant to get even higher and uh, basically blackmail the senator and win back her mining operation on Lethal using Grand Moff Tarkin as leverage against her enemies. It's it, it's a, it was a great political move, uh, and I commend her for that. Um, and it really fleshes out the character that we see in Rebels. Um, to be honest, I, I didn't really like Governor Price in Rebels. She was kind of dry, and I, I, I just couldn't get into her a lot. But um, until the end of season three, but this book actually fleshed her out a little bit more for me, and I have a new appreciation for the governor uh, because of that. She was. It's, it's almost inspiring in an odd way. Yes, she's a bad person, but her work ethic, man, you, you can't top that. You, you really can't. Maybe you should get into politics. No. no, no I thought about it once, but no. So, like I said before, um, their paths kind of intertwine in, in, in between the stories. Each time that Thrawn rose to the ranks, Price was steadily getting her way back. Towards the end of the book, they kind of understand that, well, Thrawn isn't good with politics and Governor Price needs his influence to kind of keep things steady in her own governorship. So it's a, it's a mutual relationship. And Thrawn, he didn't really understand politics, but he knew how this relationship would work and he admired the governor for all the work that she had done in the past and her willingness to work with them before, and so that's why you see their relationship um, in the state that it is when we finally meet them together in Rebels, and why Governor Price was able to finally get Thrawn to fight with her to stop the little rebel, rebel operation. And we get a little hint to that in the book, which is really cool. It's a nice little introduction to the book A New Dawn. Oh, so I a, a couple of the things uh, that I didn't really get into was, uh, and it's not that big. Uh, a couple things were made canon in this series. We have uh, the flagship, the Chimera, that Thrawn flies. Um, I honestly I forget if it's in Rebels or not. Um, it could have been. They just didn't really name it. But yes, the Chimera is back, and that is Grand Admiral Thrawn's flagship. Uh, and then there is the Judicator, which if you'll remember if you read uh, Heir to the Empire is one of the first uh, Imperial Star Destroyers that Thrawn has indirect command of. That is ultimately destroyed um, and <laughs> is reintroduced in this book and it is almost destroyed again, but it's not. But I, I think it's really cool that there are little elements like that that Timothy Sand didn't forget and was able to incorporate into the new Thrawn book. Um, there were probably other hints that I can think of right now to the old trilogy, um, but for now, I, that's... Uh, honestly, I thought that was really cool. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, Star Wars Thrawn came out this month, and man, I enjoyed it. And I, and I really wish if Timothy Zahn, for, for 
any chance that you see this video, um, I, I, I would love to read more of your books. I grew up with them, as I'm sure a lot of other people did, and I can't wait to learn more about Thrawn in Season 4 of Rebels, as well as anything that you would want to cook up. I, I need answers! <laughs> Anyways, uh, again, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it's a little, it was a little bit longer uh, than I wanted it to be. There's a lot that I want to say on it regarding the culture, uh, the the challenges that Thrawn had to go through, the little nuances on it, and of course the parallels to the original Thrawn trilogy that I thought were worth mentioning that you couldn't really get in a actual blog. I mean, it could, but not the way that I would want it to have delivered it. Um, so again, thanks for watching this video everybody, and again, if you like this video, give it a big thumbs up, thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more Star Wars content, uh, there's a lot more to come in the months to come. Also you'll notice that I'm wearing this cool Star Wars shirt, uh, I love you, and then my fiance has, I know, with Han Solo on it, yes, it should be the opposite, whatever, I do what I want. Um, <laughs> But we're actually going to be going to Disneyland tomorrow, which is why I'm wearing this shirt, because I wanted to talk about that. Um, so you should definitely subscribe, because there's going to be some Star Wars line updates that um, you're only going to check out on this channel. So go ahead, click that button, and I'll see you guys in the next video. May the Force be with you. Thanks for tuning in today. If you liked this video, please give it a big thumbs up. If you're a Star Wars fan, you definitely want to make sure you subscribe. Take the time to visit our Patreon account in the description below to help support the channel and all future products we have in store. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to keep up with my daily devices. That's all for today, Star Wars fans. May the Force be with you.